Hey friends, this is a show I've been calling Plain Spoke and I do a lot of different segments. Um, one of them, I've been going through the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline. Actually, I've only done one segment before I went through the doctrinal standards uh, because that's what's required in order for people to vote on joining the Global Methodist Church. They have to stay, say that they agree with the doctrinal standards and the social witness. And so this is gonna be part two of a several part series walking through the uh, transitional book of doctrines and dic discipline. And uh, <laughs> uh, today I'm, I'm joined by my brother, Daniel Rickman. He's gonna help me go through the social witness of the church. And so we're gonna uh, spend some time uh, going through uh, several slides that I put together. It's only two pages whenever you read the transitional book of doctrines and discipline, but um, it has a lot of scriptural citations. So we're gonna talk through the scriptures and how much they support the, um, the, the, the stances that the Global Methodist Church is taking. And then um, we'll, we'll hopefully encourage you along the way to, to be more scripturally um, aware and, and literate and to connect what you read in the Bible to modern day issues. Uh, Daniel and I both spent a, a little bit of time reviewing this stuff, but we haven't reflected upon it as deeply as we should. So we're gonna be doing some reflecting in this time. I'd invite you to be in a reflective spirit as well. And then um, whether you're already in the Global Methodist Church and you're wanting to know more about what it stands for or you're thinking about joining it, uh, the intent here really is to build up the church, have uh, uh, people actually know what different groups stand for. I came out of the United Methodist Church where people were of the mind that you could believe anything and be a Methodist. And that's really not what the Global Methodist Church is, is going for. So what are the essential beliefs practices, sto social stances, that's what um, we're gonna be covering in this series. So I'd invite you, if you haven't already, to subscribe, um, whether you're on uh, YouTube or Facebook or some other uh, podcast medium, and then uh, just be along with me for the ride. All right, um, I'm gonna introduce you to my brother. This is my brother, Daniel. And uh, Daniel, you're preaching at Blackwell and Brayman. Um, as we talk through this, what's important for people to know about you? I have a wife named Catherine, um, and we met at Asbury Theological Seminary, and uh, where we both had a great education, and been serving now uh, in ministry for a little over three years, so I'm still kind of a newbie, and um, yeah, those are the bare basics. I, I have a bit of a history in German. That was kind of my thing before I went into ministry. I lived abroad and studied German and still like to use it occasionally, has still have friends over there. So maybe those are some of the most basic facts about me. We'll put any uh, contact information that you want for Daniel on the um, show notes to this. So if, if you're interested in his ministry, how you can support him, uh, if he gives me anything, I'll put it in the show notes. If he gives me nothing, that means he does not want to hear from you. So do not reach out. Um, all right, so what we're going to do is we're going to reach out. We're going to um, read through this presentation that I put together You'll, if you're watching this, you'll see the same slide that we do. Um, I, I think he and I will just go back and forth and reading this stuff. We might interrupt one another if we have a thought that we want to share that, that we might forget. There's a lot of content here, and we don't want to give it short shrift. So that's the dance that we're doing. So um, uh, so that Daniel can get his sea legs, I'll, I'll read through the first one, and then we'll just move forward from there. So this is the very beginning of the social witness section. It begins following both the example and teachings of Jesus, whom we believe that God calls us to love and serve others around the world in his name. I didn't. I said who we believe, but it just says we believe that God calls us to, to love and serve others around the world in his name. Since God first stirred the hearts of John and Charles Wesley to feed the hungry, visit those in prison, oppose slavery, and care for those less fortunate, Methodists have believed in meeting people at their point of need and offering them Jesus. We are convinced that faith, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And that quote is from James 2.17, quote, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And that as Jesus reminded us, when we do not do what is needed to care for the least of our sisters and brothers, we likewise have not done so for Christ either. This is what Jesus says, quote, then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. 
It was in that spirit that the Methodist Episcopal Church became the first denomination in the world to adopt a formal social creed in 1908, spurred by the social gospel in response to the deplorable working conditions of millions. Though reflective of its own time, the statement is still remarkably relevant even today, calling for, among other things, equal rights and complete justice for all men in all stations of life, principles of conciliation and arbitration in industrial dissensions, abolition of child labor, the suppression of the sweating system, a reduction of the hours of labor to the lowest practical point, a release from employment one day in seven, and for a living wage in every industry. In turn, that prophetic witness was subsequently embraced by each of the other branches of Methodism and the Evangelical United Brethren Church, and continues this day within the global Methodist Church. As a global church, our social witness represents a consensus vision transcending cultures of what it means to be faithful disciples in a world that remains in rebellion against its Creator, racked by violence and unfettered greed. It is a summons to prayerfully consider how to do good and do no harm to all as we put our faith into practice. I didn't announce it whenever I first started reading, but the social witness portion is just part two in the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline, and this is paragraph 202. So we we just got done reading paragraph 201, uh, which was the setup for now there are going to be 14 particular social witness stances that we're expected to stand by in the Global Methodist Church. Here's the first one. We believe that all persons, irrespective of their station or circumstances in life, have been made in the image of God and must be treated with dignity, justice, and respect. We denounce as sin, racism, sexism, and other expressions that unjustly discriminate against any person. So as proof texts, they have two, do they have two citations or three? Oh, they have five. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the first two. This is Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you're curious, this is the English Standard Version. Um, the, the second citation is Deuteronomy 16, 19 through 20. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. And you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice and only justice you shall follow that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Okay, so from Luke 11, verse 42, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb, and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. And then Luke 19, verse 9, And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. And then uh, lastly, Colossians chapter 3, verse 11, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Okay, number two. We believe that life is a holy gift of God, whose beginnings and endings are set by God, and that it is the particular duty of believers to protect those who may be powerless to protect themselves, including the unborn, those with disabilities or serious illness, and the aged. So I actually did a, a segment with the Fugates. Did you see this? I saw the beginning. I That's finished fine. it. So me and Sarah Beth sat down with um, Nathan and Holly Fugate, who are much more active in the anti-abortion, pro-life. Yeah, I don't think they call themselves anti-abortion, but pro-life. And then, of course, it has implications for end of life, mental, Ill mental disability, and the unborn. And they are advocating for the GMC to take a strong stand on this. And I wish I had thought to look in the Transitional Book of Doctrines and Discipline for what was said here, because it is a pretty strong statement. The uh, scriptural undergirding is Genesis 2-7, which says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. 
Leviticus 19.32 says, you shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man, and you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. So that would address the aged. Jeremiah 1.5 says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So the notion being that the unique call of Jeremiah is, is uh, reflected in every single person. And then uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 41 through 44 has the story of Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. The sacredness of all life compels us to resist the practice of abortion except in the cases of tragic conflicts of life against life when the well-being of the mother and the child are at stake. We do not accept abortion as a means of birth control or gender selection, and we call upon all Christians as disciples of the Lord of life to prayerfully consider how we can support these women facing unintended pregnancies without adequate care, counsel, or resources. Uh, you want me to go ahead and read the scriptures? Sure. So the first comes from Exodus 22, verses 22 and 23. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry. Then James 1, verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God and God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. And then finally, uh, Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This is point four, still paragraph 202. So all of these, the rest is going to be in paragraph 202. We believe that all should have the right to work in safe conditions with fair compensation and free of grinding toil or export, exploitation by others. We respect the right of workers to engage in collective bargaining to protect their welfare. We pray that all should be allowed to freely follow their vocations, especially those who work on the frontiers of truth and knowledge and those who may enrich the lives of others with beauty and joy. We acknowledge that science and technology are gifts of God intended to improve human life, and we encourage dialogue between faith and science as mutual witnesses to God's creative power. All right, so we're not anti-science. Let it be known. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we'll come back to some of this, but here's the scriptural citations. Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 14 says, Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. So, of course, that one, I doubt they're trying to reinstitute the Sabbath in the way that the Hebrews observed it. I'm sure they're just making the case, hey, shouldn't be rest. Uh, people need rest. Yeah, people need rest. You shouldn't be working. issue of justice. Everybody needs rest. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so back to the citations. Luke 10, 7 through something. It might just be 7. No, it's just 7. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not go from house to house. That's Jesus' instructions to the disciples when they're going house to house ministering. Uh, I'm not sure what it has to do with this particular... I think they're just playing off of the phrase, the laborer deserves his wages. Oh, that feels kind of like proof texting to me, but you know, whatever. Okay, sure. So whether you eat or drink, this is 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. How's that one connected? I think it's uh, the language where they talked about uh, people being freely allowed to freely follow their vacations, especially those who work on the frontiers of truth and knowledge and those who may enrich the lives of others with beauty and joy. So whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do it, do it for to God's the glory, glory of God. Yeah, okay. there's a lot of vocations out there that can do things for God's glory that are beautiful and, and 
okay. testify to the truth. And then 1 Timothy 5, 18, quote, For the Scripture says, quote, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Yeah, point five, I think it's your turn to read. We believe that God has called us to share his concern for the poor and to alleviate the conditions and policies which have produced vast disparities in wealth and resources, both among individuals and nations giving rise to poverty. We are called to improve the quality of life and opportunities for all God's people as we share the good news to the poor and freedom for the oppressed. First scriptures from Leviticus 19, verses 9 through 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And then Matthew 25, verses 37 through 40. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. Luke 6, 20 through 25. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples, this is talking about Jesus, and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. So that was the Sermon on the Plain in Luke 6. Uh, James 2, verses 1 through 5 says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and you say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or sit down at my feet. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those that are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? Point six, I think it's my turn to read. Is it? I don't, yeah. Okay, yes. I'll take it. We believe that all have been summoned to care for the earth as our common home, stewarding its resources, sharing in its bounty, and exercising responsible and sustainable consumption so that there is enough for all. So here's our environmental ecological statement. Uh, we, have, we have three citations. Um, Genesis 2.15 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. The notion there being that um, God gave us responsibility not to screw this place up. Yeah, and that, like, working and keeping is kind of stewarding. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, Psalm 24, 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. Okay, so it's not ours, mm -hmm. it's his, yeah. so we need to not screw it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then Leviticus 26, 34 through 35. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate, while you are in your enemy's land, then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall have rest, the rest that it did not have on your Sabbaths when you were dwelling in it. Point seven. We believe that human sexuality is a gift of God that is to be affirmed as it is exercised within the legal and spiritual covenant of a loving and monogamous marriage between one man and one woman. Uh, the first quote, it doesn't appear on the screen I'm looking at. Yeah, it does. It's Matthew 19, 3 through 9. Oh, it's just so a longer it, quote. It, yeah, it goes on, yeah, it goes on to the other yeah. side. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? 
He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. And then the next one was from Exodus 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. This is, oh, it's just Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. This is, uh, again, still located in this, this one sentence on the only case in which sexuality is okay. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, or the husband, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit and everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Quote, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each, of, each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is point eight. We are saddened by all the expressions, by all expressions of sexual behavior, including pornography, polygamy, and promiscuity, that do not recognize the sacred worth of each individual, or that seek to exploit, abuse, objectify, or degrade others, or that represent less than God's intentional design for his children. While affirming a scriptural view of sexuality and gender, we welcome all to experience the redemptive grace of Jesus and are committed to I think the key word there was all. We welcome all to experience the redemptive grace of Jesus and are committed to being a safe place of refuge, hospitality, and healing for any who may have experienced brokenness in their sexual lives. So that's making clear we're not the anti-LGBTQ church. If people have identified in one way or another anywhere on the rainbow spectrum, they they may come as well. We are going to articulate a biblical view yeah, of sexuality. They're welcome to come and be redeemed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So the scriptural citations, there are two on this page. I think there are probably more. Uh, Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then Genesis 2.24, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Both of these have already been cited as proof texts in previous uh, ones before. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so this is, all, is rebuking not just homosexuality, but also the transsexual phenomenon. God made males and females, mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's God's good design, and your job is not to buck that, but to accept that and to receive blessing in that. Yeah. Anything else? Um, why don't you read... Why don't you read the other scriptures and then uh, comment? Okay. Yeah, 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 20. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified. You were justified in the, in the same name, okay, sorry, some of the letters are cut off, so we're just trying to guess, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, 
the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. We believe that children, whether through birth or adoption, are a sacred gift to us from God, and we accept our responsibility to both protect and nurture the youngest among us, particularly against such abuses as enforced child labor, involuntary conscription, human trafficking, and other such practices in the world. Uh, The first scripture from Deuteronomy 4, verses 9 through 10, "...only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children, how on on the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb, the Lord said to me, "'Gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they live on the earth, and that they may teach their uh, children so.'" And then uh, Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is a man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. For this is pleasing in the sight of God. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. If any believing woman has relatives who are widows, let her care for them. Let the church not be burdened so that it may care for those who are truly widows. Point 10. We believe that followers of God have been called to exercise self-control and holiness in their uh, personal lives generosity and kindness in their relationships, relations with others, and grace in all matters of life. It's kind of just a statement about holiness. And holiness. Mm-hmm. And personal lives. Yeah, not mm-hmm. just systems. And Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the first scripture comes from Romans 12, 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be reverent, fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Uh, the next one is Galatians 5, 22 through 30, uh, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Uh, point 11, we believe in the rule of justice and law in society. I think they said that for the Reagan conservatives. <laughs> Uh, Nixon conservatives, in the, in the right of individuals to follow God's call and to lawfully immigrate to new places, okay, they put that for the Democrats, I guess, <laughs> and in the pursuit of peace, both between nations and individuals, okay. We offer ourselves to work in order to reduce the bitterness that has overflowed in God's world. Okay, there's a lot there. Uh, we'll try and hold on to all of it. The first citation is Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Next citation is 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Okay, I see the themes 
there being very clear. The next one is kind of a lengthy one from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 19. Therefore, remember that at one time you gentle... Okay, so first off, there was a typo on this one. It made no sense. Mm -hmm. So I think this is the section that we're talking about, but okay. I, I'm not for sure which one. That, okay, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made of the flesh by hands, in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus, of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in, his, in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 19. Uh, Isaiah 11, verses 1 through 9. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his root shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see, or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fatted calf, fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. All right, this is point 12. We believe the practice of the golden rule, treating others as we would wish to be treated, can effectively guide our social and business relationships. We seek to cultivate the mind of Christ and a heart for others. We have two citations here. Matthew 7, 12 says, So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's, of course, Jesus' words. And then in Romans 12, 1 through 2, Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Point 13, I believe it's your turn. We believe that each person should have the right to exercise their religious beliefs without fear of persecution, and that government should respect freedom of religion and the important role of faith communities within the greater society. We further denounce discrimination or persecution which may target any because of their gender, economic status, ethnic or tribal identity, age, or political views. From Isaiah 1, verse 17, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Matthew 5, verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Romans 8, verse 35, who shall, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger 
or sword. Final one is is point fourteen. And your turn. Is it okay? This is the last one, folks. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness when the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of Christ, and we accept our calling to work towards that end as Christ's light and the salt of the earth. Here, here's the scriptural citations. You are the salt of the earth. Oh, okay, yeah, you're, you're citing, you already cited this. Mm-hmm. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So I would just say to that one, there's a far cry between being a preservative and actually saving the world. Mm -hmm. There's a far cry between being light and shining light and saving the world and, and building the kingdom. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's against this notion of building the kingdom that I'm about. Um, Revelation eleven fifteen through 17. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power, and begun to reign. You know, I was happy with them for putting this in here, and now I'm not happy because they've skipped over all the violent overthrow, and all that's left is the world has become the Mm -hmm. kingdom of God. Well, how did it become? Well, Christ showed up on a white horse, that's how. Mm -hmm. And then the last bit, they just say, read Revelation 21 and 22, but that similarly is after all of the hostile takeover. If you have thoughts on the the social witness of the Global Methodist Church, they're very welcome in the comments. You can write me privately at plainspokenpod at gmail.com. Um, if, if you think it's good for me to be fostering these kind of conversations, it's good for the GMC and the UMC and Wesleyanism and Christianity, I'm trying to help all of these, then uh, go over to locals.com and find my channel and become a supporter this this stuff costs money and time and energy, and my church is is supporting this, hoping that it is helpful to you. So um, hopefully we can have a symbiotic relationship with the larger connections. So thanks to my brother Daniel for joining me today. For and me uh, you know, if you can't tell, we've we've talked a lot for many years about these most meaningful things. We're just picking up where we left off each time. So uh, thanks to you for engaging in the conversation, and I'll see you next time. Blessings.